April Levine Garrett, and this is Amplify Baltimore. On January 14th, Civic Frame will be hosting a free and open to the public screening of the award-winning Todd Lending documentary, Omar and Pete. Omar and Pete is the inspiring story of two African-American men from Baltimore who face challenges with regard to offender reentry. Today's show will be about several organizations who are helping former offenders reacclimate to Baltimore City and become productive citizens. I'm honored to be here today with two people featured in Omar and Pete, William Pete Duncan and Andre Fisher. William P. Duncan, you were one of the main characters in this film about offender reentry, and you told your story really beautifully and painstakingly in the film. I wanted to ask you about how that process was for you to tell your story with the struggles that you faced as someone who was reentering after being incarcerated. It wasn't really a struggle. I, th I think one of the biggest things um, that I had to face was um, trust issues, mm -hmm. you know, being um, my past, um, trust wasn't uh, number one. By the time the film uh, came my way, uh, I had made it a habit of telling the truth. Yeah. You know, um, I did what I did. Um, I paid my price for all the crimes I committed, you know, and basically um, me telling the truth was actually really giving me a uh, key to, uh, uh, to the freedom. When you got out after the 19 years, uh, you made some significant changes in your life and you also started to help other folks who face the same predicament that you did. Tell me a little bit about how that came to be. You know, um, one of the things that the film uh, doesn't really tell is that after serving the 19 years and nine months, I returned back to prison five times for five violations. Wow. Because uh, at the time when I was released from the long um, period of time I stayed in prison, there was no programs like Merle Reentry. Now, know. when were you first released? Uh, I was first released in um, April of uh, 1986, okay. and I returned, like I said, I returned five times, but I was released in 2001, which um, I've been um, in society for close to 11 years now. You were released in 2001, and that's really when we started to see a lot of these reentry programs evolve. I'm going to come to Andre Fisher, who is the coordinator for reentry programs for the Druid Heights uh, Community Development Center. You were also in the film as someone working in the reentry population. Tell me when it started to click with, you know, the Department of uh, Corrections and with the police department and the like that reentry programs are really, really important. Well, uh, what they saw was uh, that rehabilitation for people coming back into society was not really working. Hmm. Uh, some of that is politics, of course, but uh, the real uh, outcome and for success of someone staying home, returning to the community, uh, becoming a productive member of society like most of us should be, became a reality when reentry was uh, formed in uh, 2000. And once that happened, we got a collaborative effort in uh, helping people returning. Now, tell me, you worked with... Uh, Pete, but you also worked with Omar. Tell me what your job and your role was um, during the, the filming of the film and, and how your position with re within the reentry community has evolved over time. Well, in the beginning, uh, I was an advocate. Uh, advocate role at that time was to help the individual navigate his way back through. Doing the uh, case plan and the uh, uh, assessment plan for that individual to strategically uh, meet its goals and be again successful. And that in your position now has evolved into? I became a case manager as well uh, during the film and uh, yes I uh, was uh, Omar's case manager at one point. Mm -hmm. And being a case manager, helping uh, you know manage and, and make the uh, client meet its goals and, and, and utilize the resources that are out here mm -hmm. for a person to uh, take advantage of. So Pete, there were so many people that helped you, reentry advocates and the like, and there are a couple of folks who are featured in the film who are here with us today, like Latanya Scott Johnson. So we're gonna go talk to her. Latanya Scott Johnson and Marshall Collins were both featured in Omar and Pete. Latanya as one of the first female case managers and Marshall as an advocate. Latanya, tell me a little bit about how you entered into this basically all-male arena to help with offender reentry. It was very, it was different. It was challenging at times being a female working with the reentry program 
because I worked with nothing but all males. Mm -hmm. And being a female and working around a bunch of inmates who was um, ex-offenders that was being released into society, sometimes they didn't take me serious mm -hmm. because they thought I didn't know what I was talking about because I have never been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But then as time went on, they actually began, be, actually gained their trust in me. And we saw that in the film. Yes, yes. The guys did actually begin to trust me because they saw I was leading them in the right path. Okay. But being hired with the reentry program, they actually decided once they birthed the, the reentry program, they decided to hire nothing but males and ex-offenders. And then they decided to hire a female, someone who's never been arrested or someone who's never been on drugs. And that's when I came in. Marshall, tell me a little bit about how you were critical to the reentry process for the folks who were in the film. Well, um, I uh, just came with with uh, love and, and, uh, of the job, and sometime I went in my pocket and went to the thrift store and you know got clothes and we put it in the cleaners when they went to look for jobs. Uh, just being myself, I done had even a couple of people uh, spend a night. You know, when they got put out of a transitional house when they relapsed. I held them at my, at my house until they had a space available at either the Turk House or any other partners that we was using at the time. What was your specific role when you were on, in the film? A reentry advocate. Tell me what that entailed. Uh, just about everything. Picking them up from the jail from the time they were released and just taking them to uh, the transitional house or recovery house they was going to and uh, f just having them uh, shadow me, you know, carrying them around to uh, get their social security card, uh, their Maryland ID, um, carrying their jobs, um, even meeting their family, sitting down talking to their family. So, you know, I, I was kind of like a big brother. So can you tell me a little bit more about what your specific role was as a case manager? 90 days before the client was actually released from the institution, we would go into the jail, the case manager and advocate would sit with the client and we would actually get to know them. We would sit with them and talk to them and ask them what it is they wanted to do once they got released from the jail. Mm -hmm. And if they said they wanted to go back to school or they wanted to get a job, my job as a case manager was to make sure that came true. Mm. Such as if they wanted to go to school, I would ask them what it is they wanted to major in. Mm. And I was supposed to help them make that dream come to light. Okay, got it. That was my job as a case right. manager. And you did that pretty successfully. Yes, we set up case plans with them. They, the case plan was not something that I wanted for the client. Mm -hmm. It was what he wanted for okay. himself. Uh -huh. And I would actually sit down, put it on paper, so that they could see what it is they wanted to accomplish once they get released from the Division of Correction and mm -hmm. to make sure it came to light. And if you want to learn more about reentry initiatives in Baltimore, to see this brilliant documentary by Todd Lending, Omar and Pete, to meet Pete and all the wonderful people who have supported him in his journey to successful offender reentry. Please join us on January 14th at the Enoch Pratt Free Library for a free screening of Omar and Pete. In 2010, 715 women were incarcerated from Baltimore City. That is 66% of the entire population of the state of Maryland. Each year, 20 women who are re-entering society are helped by Alternative Directions. I'm here today to speak with the Executive Director, Michelle Kelly. Michelle, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Michelle, you have an incredible story about how you took on this position and how you came up through the ranks and Alternative Directions to become the Executive Director. Tell us a little bit about your life story and how you got here. In 1990, I was convicted for a second-degree murder charge. Mm. Um, I stayed uh, incarcerated for nine years hmm. down at DOC, the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. Okay. Um, during that time of incarceration, I found, um, listening to a lot of stories of the women, about their children, um, me, myself, I had a daughter at that time hmm. who okay. I left behind. How old was your and daughter when time, you were incarcerated? At that time, my daughter was four. Okay. So at that time, it was um, a lot of emotional distress that I was going under as well, leaving her behind. But fortunately, I had good family members that did raise my daughter, um, and she got the best education. And at that time, I was able, I didn't want to see my daughter, mm. you know, because I knew emotionally it would tear me apart. Um, so did you see your daughter while you were incarcerated? Yes, I did. Okay, but, but not often. Was, not often. It was at a 
um, we used to have a um, family day. Okay. And at that family day, it was more so of an outside event where you had other children, they had um, games and music, mm -hmm. and you sit down and you talk, you know, engage with your child. That was a different setting from then in the visiting room. Right, and you didn't want to And I didn't want to in the visiting room. Okay. So, so why inside, I had to change um, my thinking ways, you know, as far as I had to take advantage of some of the educational programs that they had down there. And at that time, they did have college courses. Hmm. Um, I did attend CCBC. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, that was down there at Essex. And also, they had um, Anne Arundel Community College okay. down there. So I took some human services classes. Um, unfortunately, by the time it was time to go further in education, the classes were pulled. Mm. So, um, What kind of impact did that have on your trajectory? Um, because I wanted to learn, uh -huh. you know, and, and, and I know once you return back home, it's going to be hard to pick up because there you had to provide for your family. So you were released in 1997 and then you ended up here at Alternative Directions in 1999. Tell me how you got here. Well, the founder of Mary Jo Davis um, saw something in me um, that I, well, she took a chance on me, you know, um, by me being previously incarcerated and me staying in contact with her when I was um, going through my trial at WDC. I'm the Women's Detention Center. So um, she called me in. She told me to come in for an interview. Okay. And when that happened, I was offered an administrative assistance job, hmm. meaning that I would just type letters for her, answer mail, open mail, organize the mail. Two years later, I became the office manager. Okay. So I had a little bit more responsibility of just answering letters. Um, I was going to meetings, um, meeting people out in the community or organizations that do the same things that we do. Um, also, um, giving her some input about what women needs are behind the fence. So you were really interacting with a lot of the clients, so you were able to translate to her some of the needs that were evolving exactly, over time. Exactly. Okay. okay. And then what brought you to the executive director position? Well, I, I was the deputy director once I was appointed, the office manager. So two years later, I was the deputy director. And with that responsibility, I was going to more meetings with Mary Jo. I was out there advocating for alternative directions. This is the best program in the whole organization. I love what the organization does, but it means so much to me because I walked these shoes before mm -hmm. the women. Mm -hmm. And to see them grow from doing an assessment behind the fence and see them grow once they are relieved, mm -hmm. it's an awesome feeling. Michelle, tell us about the mission of alternative directions. Well, our mission, we assist individuals in prison, returning back to the community, um, to help them face barriers that they may reach returning back to the communities. Mm -hmm. um, women in particular, we help them with transitional housing, um, family reunification, child support modification, divorces, because you know, some of the women are able to get divorced behind bars because of domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, that they can't do it on the outside mm -hmm. that they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. um, also with um, sexual abuse, um, on down to parenting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, GED training, and mm -hmm. also finding, um, getting edu well, receiving an education and also job training. Okay, it's, it's interesting because um, in the thread of interviews that we've done today, lots of folks have talked about the mentality, right? Mm -hmm. That there is a way of thinking that is accompanied with the behavior that gets people incarcerated mm -hmm. that has to be broken down. And a lot of times people are coming back into communities where that is writ large and it has not changed. Um, what are the things that your organization is doing to help people get out of that mindset, to get out of those communities um, that are, are not really providing them with? Intensive case management. We see our women three times a week. Mm. We, are, um, we have our parole agent, Shelly Colston come to our office to see our women. So we, it's like a, a, a hand in hand thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we walk our women through this program because we know it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. And we know it's not easy, especially if you have drug abuse history. You know, um, the intensive case management, we follow up with them through all the treatment. And the whole ideal about the turnabout program, we don't allow women to go home. Mm -hmm. We, for the first six months to a year, they have to stay in a transitional recovery house. Okay. Um, so with that, they get to go to these 20 meetings or mm -hmm. the meetings a day. They start to build a network mm -hmm. with other individuals that have um, the disease the same as they do. Mm -hmm. And 
you have to change people, places, and things. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I had to do. They got me incarcerated. I had to change people, places, and things. Well, it's clear that you've learned some incredible lessons and that you've taken the skill set that you've gotten by being mentored by Mary Jo Davis. Yes. And made something incredible out of your story and your witness. So we thank you for that. We thank you for the work that you're doing with this population. And we thank you for the ways that you're amplifying Baltimore. Thank you. And next we'll talk with Yvonne Baker, an Alternative Directions client. I'm here with Yvonne Baker, our current Alternative Directions client who was recently released from the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women after serving 23 years. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Tell me a little bit about your story. You recently came to Alternative Directions. You've been with a client for about two months, correct? Yes. Tell me your story about how you ended up being incarcerated. Okay, um, my crime happened on July the 21st. And- What year was that? 1988. I've been incarcerated for 23 years. How old were you in 1988? I was 22 years old. I went to jail for 35 years. I had life suspended over 35 years. Um, the crime happened um, because of my daughter had um, got suffocated and I was charged with it. Hmm. And um, when we went to court, um, I had uh, no witnesses against me. Um, the only two people that was there was my mother and sister. They was the only two people there. And um, they was uh, testifying for the state. So your mother and daughter, your mother. And baby sister. And your, your baby sister testified against you? Yes. Now, how old was your child? My daughter was six months old. Six months old, okay. So, clearly, the end of that trial led you to being incarcerated. Yes. When you knew you were about to come out, there were programs that were probably offered to you to get you ready to, to yes. re-enter society. Can you tell me a little bit about those programs and what resources they provided you with, and then also how you got to alternative directions, ultimately? Once my sentence got lowered and I was about to get out, I had someone to call Michelle Kelly and um, asked her if she would take me in because I was now homeless. Mm -hmm. I had no way to go. How is it that you connecting with Alternative Directions and the work that they're doing here and the other organizations that help folks who are connecting back in society, how are you positioning yourself to try to find stable employment? Are you employed now? No, but I'm looking. Okay. So Alternative Directions is clearly helping you with that path. And Goodwill. Goodwill Industries, another yes. great organization. Personally, how is your relationship like with your family? Oh man, it's great. My family mm. is great to me. They is good. I mean, I thought when I got home, they was gonna be like, I don't want her around me because she been in jail. You know, they is not like that. Oh, my baby sister, she is so good to me. Is this the same you one know? who testified yes. against you? Yes. Okay. She is so good to me and my son, my daughter, and I have another daughter, and I have another son. Oh, they are so great to me. They glad to see me home. They don't ever want me to go back to prison sure. no more. Mm -hmm. You are clearly somebody who's driven. You're very yes. bright, I can tell that, just from this interview. If somebody were watching this interview right now, as they are, what kind of chance would you want them to give you? Um, a chance to, you know, um, help me to cope with society. And um, maybe throw out some jobs and a little job here or there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a little employment would yes. be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why would I take a chance on you? I just heard your story. I heard it. You know, I know all the stuff about you. Why would I take a chance on you? Why would you take a chance on me? Because I'm gonna be a successful person. You know, I'm loyal. I'm trustworthy. And I'm the type of woman that won't let another woman down mm -hmm. or anyone in that nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very smart, I'm bright, mm -hmm. and I got potentials. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you have clearly demonstrated that you're a tenacious person. Yes. And that you want to do well. Yes. What challenges do you think you're going to be facing over the next few months? Um, 
just um, really no challenges like finding jobs and um, getting back into school because I've been out been out of society for 23 years. Mm -hmm. um, I need somebody that's going to be loyal and trust me. I, I can't, Yvonne, I can't thank you enough for sharing your powerful oh. story. I, I, I know people are going to be really moved by this interview. Yes. Um, and I know there are lots of people watching this, like, rooting for you and screaming at the television yes. and saying, I hope this woman stays on the straight and narrow, yes. and I hope that she is successful. And I just, I can't thank you enough for the way that you oh. are amplifying the, the, the lives of women who are formerly incarcerated yes. and, and making us all open our hearts up and be a little bit more empathetic to the yes. things that you're experiencing. So thank you so much you're for that. welcome, because I have a testimony. And you gave it. Yes. And you'll continue to give it. Yes, I will. And thank you so much for sharing it on you're the welcome. show today. Thank you. Welcome. And next, we will be talking with Nabil Kareem from the Living Classrooms Reentry Program. Project Serve helps about 60 people a year reenter society after being incarcerated. We are here today with Nabil Kareem, the reentry coordinator for the Living Classrooms. Nabil, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm happy to be here. Tell me how you came to do this work. Uh, uh, as a result of being incarcerated myself for approximately 23 years. 23 years. Yep. Yeah, uh, I saw that a person could make a change. Mm -hmm. I had some people help me, and I said that we need more people stepping out trying to help people to make changes, the ones that wanted to do so. You were incarcerated for 23 years. Mm -hmm. Did you commit your offense in Baltimore City? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. What was your offense? Offense was armed robbery and a murder. Okay. What were the circumstances around your life that you think created the conditions for you to be in a lifestyle that led you to being incarcerated? Well, at that particular time, uh, we had uh, in my home uh, no father, mm. uh, mother with a small amount of education trying mm -hmm. to take care of six children, mm -hmm. uh, had uh, me without motivation. Mm. Uh, and maybe not having the proper uh, influences and role models in my life. Sure. Uh, not uh, having the people who could point out to me options and possibilities, but a lot of people that talked about all the negatives. What neighborhood did you grow up in? In West Baltimore. Uh -huh. And what was your highest level of education before you became incarcerated? Uh, I, before I became incarcerated, I had been in the military, so uh -huh. I would gotten a GED okay. in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I didn't go to college until I was incarcerated. Okay, so you did have the opportunity to take some college level classes when you yes, were incarcerated. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you came back to society from being incarcerated what year? Uh, 1998. 1998, so you came back to Baltimore. Yes. What was that experience like for you? Well, it was a shocker. I bet. And I had been one that was uh, thought to be a leader in the institution sure. and knew about different things that were going on. Mm -hmm. And when I got out, let me give you an example. A friend of mine picked me up in his Range Rover. Mm. We went downtown to Lexington Market. Mm -hmm. He said, wait right here in the Range Rover. He double parked it and it still was running. And I was in the passenger seat. He said, um, I'm going to go into the market and pay a quick bill and I'll be right back out. If the police comes, you got your driver's license because he had helped me do that already. Sure. He said, uh, just move the truck and right. go around the block and I'll be here when you come back. Yeah. Right. So police did come, did ask me to move the truck. Uh -huh. I got in the seat, tried to move the truck. I could not get it in gear. Uh. And I started sweating. Oh, wow. I, my anxiety level just went through the through roof, the roof. Uh -huh. and an officer standing there at the window kind of tapping his foot like, What's going you gonna on? move this sure. or what? You know? And I'm saying to myself, I must know how to put this car in gear. I drove mm -hmm. all my life. Right. I couldn't get it in gear. And then I said to myself, do what you learn. I said, officer, I just become, I came from uh, incarceration at 23 years. I don't know how to put it in gear, but I do not know how to drive. He said, put your feet on a brake right. and shift it in gear. Uh -huh. And I did that and I pulled off. Mm. What did that experience do for you with regard to the rest of your trajectory for reentering society? It, it let me know that I was also on a learning curve. Mm -hmm. that there were a number of things I thought that I knew that I still had to work on. Mm -hmm. It was always a, a time for me to understand that I'm always in a learning 
mode, just like I'm in a teaching mode. And also that there are some people that might surprise you who will help you along the way. Yeah, that too. Right. right. So you took all of that experience mm -hmm. and you turned it into helping other people through Project Serve and also your work with reentry with the Living Classrooms Foundation. Correct. Tell me a little bit more about the Living Classrooms Foundation commitment to uh, reentry programs, but also specifically what the mission is for Project Serve. Okay, our mission in Project Serve is to go in to prisons, engage people for three to four months behind the wall, talk to them about uh, classes like Thinking for a Change, Life Skills, to try to get them to move in a new direction, try to get them to see the possibilities rather than all the detractors, to try to get them to see that you can do this, I did it, I'm one person, I can show you five or six other people who did it, and let them see that you can do the same thing. So when you're in, in the prison system talking with them before they come out, what mm -hmm. is the most critical information you're trying to impart to them to get their minds prepared to being back in society? The main thing I try to impart to them is that you have to stop being afraid. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to say, I'm going to take a risk on me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a chance on my future. Mm -hmm. That I'm going to step out and try some new things, some different things and be unafraid of trying those things. Mm -hmm. Failure is not an option, and that when I don't succeed, that I look at that and say, okay, what can I learn from that, and then move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the structure of Project Serve once they get out? Okay, once they get out, I pick them up at the door of the prison. Uh -huh. I take them to get a drug test, mm -hmm. because people use drugs in prison. Sure. If they are clean from the drug test, they come to Project Serve proper, and we set them up with a uniform. Hmm. We set them up with a monthly bus pass. Wow. We uh, let them know that they'll be making a minimum wage, which is $7.25 an hour, that they'll be working 40 hours a week. They'll be working in a crew. Mm -hmm. uh, we have already talked to them about the things that you have to be doing here, like team spirit, uh, getting to work on time, using initiative, uh, having a proper attitude. Uh, being positive, learning how to uh, kind of be part of a team as opposed to everybody doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we try to help them with all type of wraparound services like housing, medical care, um, different things that they might have come up in their home, problems like uh, they might have a home where they have to go back and they can't uh, study. They can't do the things they need a to do. A little chaotic, right? Yeah. So uh -huh. we try to find options for them to uh, live in a different place. So you talked about the fear factor that a lot of folks who are coming back into society after being incarcerated have. Um, their, their hopes and dreams are often dashed by what they think their peers and the larger society would say about them. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the people of Baltimore who are not former offenders that they could do to help smooth that transition out a little bit? Well, uh, that question has uh, different parts to it. Uh -huh. uh, the employees, for instance, mm -hmm. they could say, let me give this person with this record, this felony record, an opportunity mm -hmm. because they want to come to work. Let me give them a chance to see if they'll work. Mm -hmm. uh, family members. Family members could be optimistic and say, okay, he's been to prison two or three times before, but this time he says he's going to do some, some different things. So to assist them and support them by encouraging them rather than saying you're going to do the same thing you always did. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, society in general, again, is to make things available to them, resources, training, uh, and of course jobs and housing. A number of our clients come out and they don't have proper housing. They have to go to places where uh, it's not a good environment for them to be into. So mm -hmm. if we had proper housing for them, that would make a, a chance for them to have successful uh, transition from prison. Well, we can clearly see the possibilities in you mm -hmm. and the wonderful work that your organization, the Living Classrooms Foundation, has well, been committed you. to for so long. So thank you so much for, one, sharing your personal story, which is very powerful. And, and anybody can see, the people of Baltimore can see um, from what you've been able to share with us today that something is definitely working. So I hope that people can get information about this program if they're facing some of the challenges of reentry that they will definitely look you up. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. Thank, Thank you. you for coming in today. Thank you.